I remember reading an article by Brian Bishop of The Verge years ago on the art of jump scare, where he described its components and compared it with the three stages of illusion detailed in Christopher Nolan's The Prestige. There's the pledge, where a character is placed into a potentially dangerous situation, the turn, where the threat is seemingly resolved and the tension removed, and the prestige, where an unexpected scare hits us without warning. This specific structure seems to have become the golden rule for horror film jump scares, and if you pay attention, you'll realize that pretty much every jump scare out there follows this exact formula with minor deviations. Let me show you a quick example. A man is looking around a creepy looking house and hears a noise. That's the pledge. He then takes the flashlight and examines the space where the noise came from and finds nothing. That's the turn. Double check for safety and it seems like the problem is solved. The prestige. Do you see what I mean? Okay, one more. A nurse hears a loud cracking from one of the patient rooms, so she enters, tensed up, carefully examining the room, only to find out that it was just some ice cubes from a cup of water. The problem seems resolved until... Can't I get any sleep? What the hell do you want? The prestige. And no, not all jump scares are in three stages. Some of them only have two, like this scene from David Sandberg's short film, Lights Out. Or this scene from Insidious. You know what, let's add this to the list. Life. This is about all mankind. There is a moment. And I'm sure we've all seen this. Birds. Whoa. Okay, maybe not that one. What I'm trying to say is that we've come to an era where making breakfast turns into a jump scare and with its overabundance has completely lost its value, being perceived as cheap and lazy. Even when it does get creative, breaking the cliché structure and approaching the audience with a fresh jump, something always feels lacking, doesn't it? As if there is no substance to the fright. But it's not the technique itself that's at fault, it's the way they're used that's the problem. You see, a jump scare isn't just a loud What many horror films seem to have forgotten is that jump scares are actually meant to bridge the scenes of a film, conveying its central idea while, sure, also startling the audience. But as a shock that's carried over to the next scene, not relieved and done with. Now, there's one director who's not really known for horror films, but who I think is one of the best directors out there when it comes to creating genuine scares. David Lynch. There's a scene from his 2001 film Mulholland Drive that I think demonstrates the most perfect use of a jump scare, defying the conventional rules I've mentioned before. To give you a brief context, this scene happens roughly 12 minutes into the film and has nothing to do with what's previously been shown. This is the first time we see these characters and we have no clue of who or where they are and why the scene is even happening. In the film's defense, the scene is meant to be this way and is purposeful not just to the scene itself, but to the rest of the film. So the scene starts off with two men in a restaurant named Winkies. Man A opens up the conversation by saying how he's had a dream of this exact dream place. This place. Man B isn't exactly happy he's brought here just for a dream tale, but decides to listen. Man A explains that it's the second dream he's had and that they're both the same dream, unfolding the same way. Starting off with him sitting at this exact table and the other man standing by the counter. And he adds that both of them were petrified beyond description for some reason. We, like the other man, are confused, but curious. Man A goes on with his story saying that There's a man at the back of this restaurant. He's the one who's doing it. That it's his horrifying face that the man never wishes to see again outside the dream. And that's it. They're here to see if that man from the dream is out there to get rid of this god-awful feeling. That's quite a long build-up for a jump scare, you may think, but what happens from here on is even more interesting. Right then. Man B gets up to pay for the meals, and right at that moment...
This is where the real buildup begins. The moment the characters and the audience realize that there is a man outside. So the two step out. And following the lead of man A, we head to the back of the restaurant, going toward the climax we know is coming, but are not ready to face. The camera focuses on objects and signs that we instinctively know are from the dream. The reality unfolding just the same way. He's hesitant to reach the back, as are we, but determined to end this fear, he continues. And the scene ends. I obviously didn't show the entire thing, so I recommend you watch the full scene separately, but you probably still agree that it was a very unsettling encounter. If you think about it though, everything about this scene is counterintuitive. Firstly, we don't even know these characters. Having no emotional attachment to the characters on screen should be a barrier in creating an atmosphere for an effective scare. That's it. Also, the scene is absent of both the turn and the prestige. There was no misdirection. We knew the scare was coming and when it was gonna happen. So why then does the scene work, and more importantly, perfect? Before anything, and a minor spoiler warning for those who haven't watched the film, Mulholland Drive at the end of the day is all about a dream. The audience isn't aware of this yet, but the scene nonetheless perfectly sets the ground for what's to come, strengthening the rest of the film with its hypnotic setup. First, it takes place in the middle of the day, at a diner full of people going against the formalities of a horror film, transforming a place of security into one that is threatening. When there is light, it's always overexposed, hinting at the unearthly nature of the setting, and when the characters are finally outside, what seemed like a bright daytime has converted into an ambiguous one, exactly like the dream the man had. It's not day or night. It, it's kind of half night, you know? The sound design is carefully crafted so that no other characters are heard and the voices of the two men are private, putting them into a trance-like state as if the place is secluded. Of all people, you're standing right over there. And the people surrounding them mere constructs of their mind. The result is a discrepancy between what we hear and what we see, a dreamlike sensation that augments the appalling narrative. The unknown man enters the scene with a loud, muffled noise, but the sound immediately gets drowned and we're left with an ominous sub-bass instead of the usual bang that often accompanies the jump scare. Not to mention that the pacing of the conversation throughout is slightly off as well. There are awkward pauses and moments of disconnection between every line that's delivered, and it further blurs the line between what's real and what's not. In fact, everything is meticulously planned for this exact purpose. For example, that man at the back of the restaurant is actually a woman. Her name is Bonnie Ahrens, who you may recognize as the nun from The Conjuring 2. She's deliberately introduced the as the man, because as subtle as it may be, that adds to the uncanniness of the whole scene. Which brings me lastly to the camera work. Except for the stationary shot of the Winkies, the rest are all unfixed, either on a crane or seemingly handheld, unsteadily floating in the air like a ghost. Not only does this create an elusive, surreal atmosphere, but it builds tension and a sense of uneasiness for the scene that might otherwise feel stale. Also note that the conversation mostly features over-the-shoulder shots to establish a connection between the two characters. That man B, in spite of his indifferent attitude, is on the same page, and that they are both inevitably a part of this nightmare. The shot also tends to move out of the OTS shot into an isolated single shot to inform us that the story being told is at its most crucial, and at the same time serves to emphasize that the other character may be finding the situation to be indiscernible, or at the very least is going through his own thoughts that the other character can't empathize with. The dreamlike crane shot spontaneously shifts the perspective from over the shoulder to single and vice versa, and so the subtle buildup of tension is only unconsciously piled up within us, while also keeping us entertained. The diner scene ends by having the camera stay at the table, and we understand that thus far the camera was simply following the character's lead. Once the men are outside, the camera now stays one step ahead, guiding them, and in turn forcing us to face the fright that awaits at the back of the restaurant. Each step of the way, our fear becomes materialized and the doubt transforms into certainty that the thing will appear. 
The revelation is particularly daunting because of this buildup, but also because the camera makes sure to have it fill up the entire frame to maximize the surprise and lessen the chance of us discerning its exact features. Notice how the creature isn't fully caught by the camera when it re-enters the frame to hide behind the walls. With a blink of an eye, it's gone from the frame and from our memory, and we're left alone in shock. Not by its looks, but by its existence. A more lasting terror. And then we cut to this. Is he dead or has he just fainted? One can't be sure, but it's a traumatic aftermath that allows for no relief and therefore no ending. The tension is still high because the characters aren't okay. And as we desperately try to regain our composure, Lynch gives you this as the last thing we see before the scene ends. The pledge that keeps you anxious to check every corner, suspect every movement for the rest of the film, and perhaps even for the rest of the night. But you won't find anything because that's the turn. And you'll feel like the threat has been removed until the prestige. Thanks everyone for watching my video, what an amazing scene, I had a lot of fun with this one as always, and I hope you enjoyed it too. If you'd like to support my work, I have a Patreon account, link in the description, and you can get access to my behind the scenes booklets, monthly podcasts, and various other things, so go check it out, and always feel free to follow me on Instagram if you just want to chat. And that's it for me.